Hello, my name is David Bruce. One of the questions I often come back to as a composer is to do with endings. How do you make an ending feel convincing and satisfying without being overly predictable and obvious? Because expectations are a big part of the build-up to an end, and it's easy for even a great composer to get them wrong. Here, for example, is the end of Tchaikovsky's piano trio in A minor. And you can hear that it sounds like we're approaching the end. You can hear the music's galloping ahead, reaching a peak of intensity. The music seems to be arriving at the home straight. But believe it or not, we're still four minutes from the end at this point. Intensity is one of the ways we can signal the ending. In fact, any kind of extreme gives us a signal as listeners that the end is approaching, simply because it's obvious there's nowhere else to go. You can't get more intense, so we must be near the end. Or the opposite, it can't fade and calm down anymore, so it must be near the end. But you can overplay that. If you keep that intensity going on too much, well, you risk just becoming someone loud and annoying. <laughs> But maybe this is just one of those things that people have different reactions to. Maybe for some of you this is one of the best, most exciting, most dramatic endings ever. I wouldn't be at all surprised. It is a matter of taste, but general tastes do seem to have changed over time. If you look at how composers have ended their pieces over the years, an interesting pattern starts to emerge. Let's just do a fairly random sample of orchestral pieces starting in the Baroque era. <laughs> Initially, endings are firm, but fairly low-key. And a little later, here's Haydn doing a nice simple 5 to 1 chord perfect cadence. But gradually, things start to become more intense. And already by the time of Beethoven, that perfect cadence sometimes feels like it's being fairly hammered to death. Don't get me wrong, I'm not counting that as one of the failed endings. In the context of the whole piece, it feels great and very satisfying. But you can already see how a more cynically minded person might start to feel that this was going over the top. But it didn't stop there, and throughout the 19th century, the trend for those endings was just to get longer, more bombastic and more dramatic. At the start of the 20th century, a work like Scriabin's Poem of Ecstasy ends like this. Well, it's hard to take that any further. I mean, what are you going to do? Hold the final chord for like five minutes? So I think it's no surprise that around this time you start to see those more cynical or ironic voices appearing. Here's Eric Satie's ending to his piano piece, Embryon de Seche, deliberately mocking that Beethoven ending. That's quite a good joke ending to a little six-minute piano piece. 
Around the same time, composers started to explore softer endings, and I talked about the use of the fade-out ending a bit in my video on silence, but several composers also seem to have struggled with the current state of expectation, particularly if they were trying to end in a more upbeat tempo. They were kind of caught between the desire to rush towards an exciting culmination and the awareness that to end triumphantly with a big bang was now a bit passé. Here's the original ending to Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. It seems almost apologetic, sort of ending with a bit of a bang, but without really having his heart in it. And it was only after pressure from the conductor Kuzovitsky, who conducted the premiere, that Bartok rewrote it and added a more definitive sounding ending, which is the only one that ever gets played today. Stravinsky too rewrote the ending of Petrushka, although in this case the new concert ending was added some 30 years later and it's actually almost never played. But you can see why he attempted it. After a final section which builds up tremendously, the final pages of the score just kind of underwhelmingly fizzle out and you're left with this feeling of, is that it? But it's interesting that despite that ending, Petrushka still remains a really good piece and a very popular one. My wife always jokes to me that you just need to make sure the beginning and the end of a piece are good because no one remembers the middle. But here is a surprising proof that a piece can be a success even if the ending fails. And I think actually that's true of all of the examples of bad endings I'm using here. Obviously there are thousands of pieces that suck generally and therefore have sucky endings, but any examples I'm including here are really from composers and pieces that are generally amazing. And something has just gone wrong with the ending for one reason or another. Which is interesting in itself to see how even when you have masterful levels of skill, you can still misjudge something. So the problem more recent composers have had with these confident endings has really continued to this day. The fade out or the decay is a sort of easier route to avoid ridicule and it's far more commonly used amongst composers, I would say. It also perhaps chimes better with the general aesthetic over the past hundred years, which has tended to shun optimism and positivity. It takes unique characters like, say, Olivier Messiaen to brave the full-on crashing ending. There are a couple of new alternatives which have appeared. One is the cute ending, which I have to admit is one I use myself quite a lot. So things build up and then it just diverts at the last moment to something unexpectedly less dramatic. So I did this for example in my piece Side Chaining. The rhythm and the momentum pushes forward and then at the last minute you're left with four soloists just gently clucking away. And another new example is one that's also common in popular music, the mid-flow cut-off where the music just suddenly stops. Here you can hear it, for example, at the end of Ligeti's Piano Concerto. So chop, and it stops dead. Now both of these are ways of mitigating the sense of obviousness you get from more traditional endings. Although, when they're done well, they both still work as endings because other aspects of the piece have reached a sense of culmination. So let's just think about what those are. What things need to conclude to give you a strong sense of an ending? Now, I think a few of the examples I'll give here are the opposite of fails. They're actually really good endings. But I think we need to study them in order to get a true understanding of how to produce a really brilliantly bad ending. So the first one is harmony. Here's the beautifully simple prelude in C major from the Well-Tempered Clavier by Bach. The piece is really just a bunch of arpeggios throughout, so it's a great piece to look at harmony as there's almost nothing else here. The closing bars, when you listen to them by themselves, don't seem like much. But 
They seem almost weak in the way the cadence of the G to the C is muted by that held C in the bass. But I would say the real end to the piece starts a lot earlier, right back sort of halfway through the whole piece. So remember we're aiming for the 5-1 perfect cadence G to C. And you can see that Bach is a bit of a tease because already here he teases the G itself, first playing a chord with F sharp in the bass and then one with A flat in the bass before finally landing on that G. And the G then stays all the way through until the final low C hits a few bars from the end and all the time Bach finds different chords to play above that low G. It even hits a C major chord but in an unstable second inversion chord with the G at the bottom. When the C in the bass does finally arrive, Bach teases us a bit more. It's an unstable C7 chord, which then moves through F over C and G7 over C before finally, finally reaching the full C major chord in the last bar. So this is a way of ending in which, yes, we can feel the end coming, but not in any annoying or obvious way. It's rather that the harmony starts pulling us there long before the final bars, making us yearn for that final resolution. It makes the end itself very, very satisfying and the journey towards that end really engrossing. Another aspect that needs to come to some kind of conclusion for a piece to end satisfactorily is the way it handles themes and ideas. Now not all pieces have real themes, like Bach Prelude didn't, but if you do use themes, recognisable, memorable material, there are various ways you can use them to bring around a sense of conclusion. One of the most common is simply setting out an initial idea, moving away from it, and then coming back to it. This is the traditional approach in a huge amount of classical music, particularly the famous sonata form. And I guess you could say that returning back and repeating ideas heard at the start of a piece gives it a sense of stability, of coming back home, so it makes it feel like a reasonable way to end. Here's the opening of Ravel's Jeu d'eau. This little idea is repeated almost immediately to set it in our memory, and then it disappears in Ravel's textures of watery arpeggios. It returns accompanied by a low pedal note about two thirds through, And this, to me, immediately gives a strong sense of we're returning home now. So notice that both Bach and Ravel have these held bass notes, often over a second inversion chord, which seems to slow the music down as a further preparation for the ending. So it seems, on the whole, we have to give several simultaneous feelings of an ending for a piece to really successfully feel like it's ending. If you think of the simplest pop song, you'll have the conclusion of the cycle of verse and chorus, but you'll also have the sense of emotional climax in the final verse. And it's the two of those together that provide the final sense of closure. And the longer the piece, I think, the more of these things need to come together. The harmony needs to start feeling like it's heading towards a conclusion from quite some way off. And in some way, the motives need to feel like they've reached their own culmination. And then that sense of momentum should also reach its peak in some form. So all of these have to come together to create that really strong final sense of closure. But then they also have to do battle with the complex cultural expectations to not seem too obvious, too mysterious, too predictable or too unpredictable. In short, it's tricky to get an ending right. Two of my favourite endings, for example, are Sibelius's Fifth and Seventh Symphonies, both of which have really unique and strange endings, which to me at least work really well, but which I struggle to fully explain. The fifth ends uniquely with a series of chords punctured by long silences. Maybe it's a sort of variant of that cute ending. And the seventh seems to kind of ooze into its final tonic. Now 
I've noticed John Adams mimicking a Sibelius ending a few times. Like here, for example, at the end of his opera, The Flowering Tree. Now, as you've already seen on this channel, I am a fan of John Adams's music, but I do find he struggles to convince me sometimes when it comes to his endings. I think generally it's pretty bad form to criticise another living artist, so I'm wary about saying this, but I'm saying this in the context of having just made three videos all about Adams, and I've also just described Petrushka, one of my all-time favourite pieces, as having a bad ending, so I hope the criticism is understood in that context. And in fact, I'm not alone in this feeling. There was actually an academic paper all about the trouble with endings in Adams's early work, which basically says that the processes he sets up don't have inevitable endings built into them. So the work is bound to stop somewhat inconclusively. And I think that's a pretty good summary. So here's his fairly recent orchestral piece, City Noir. <laughs> Now in many ways it's a very exciting ending, it's certainly one of the loudest, and there's a real sense of peak in terms of energy and momentum. And yet exciting as it is, it still clearly feels like we're on a journey. There's no sense of arrival or even approaching arrival. So when the ending comes suddenly, it feels rather like Bartok's original ending. It's a bit of a letdown in terms of its suddenness. <laughs> And I suppose that's what I find so frustrating but also so interesting about all of these not quite perfect endings. You feel that so much is right, you can just feel that one piece that's missing that's preventing it from being a fully satisfying ending that you're longing for. Again, maybe you disagree, do let me know in the comments. But just one final thought I want to leave you with is to do with the assumption I've maintained throughout all of these examples. That assumption is that a piece intends to take a listener on a journey that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Perhaps music doesn't have to be like that. Perhaps you could just tune in to a series of moments. This is something Stockhausen thought about when he invented what he called moment form. But it's also probably true of music where active, attentive listening is not required. Music intended to put you in a more trance-like or meditative state. I find this whole concept very interesting, but I find it impossible to write anything like that myself because part of the excitement, the game of music for me, is dealing with expectation and memory and balancing the web of interrelated sensations and emotions that music evokes over time, and trying to achieve an overall effect that just leaves you fulfilled and satisfied. And as we've seen, it's a pretty challenging area to get right. And just like a brain scientist can learn a lot from a small brain injury in an otherwise healthy patient, so I think we can learn a lot from endings that don't quite work in pieces by otherwise first-rate composers. So to all of you failed endings out there, I salute you. So a massive thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. You help keep this channel going. If you want to sign up for that, there's a link below. And don't forget to subscribe, and you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.